um, series of uh, talks on algorithmic sustainable design, the future of architectural theory. Here's our logo. And today we have lecture number 11. And I would like to discuss uh, the Duane Plata Zyberg or DPZ codes, urbanist codes. Uh, more generally, the new urbanism movement. Uh, Stephen Muzon's project, which uh, uses the codes and uh, goes more towards the Alexander's uh, generative codes. And uh, finally, I will uh, end with some uh, remarks on tall buildings, which are uh, very appropriate today. Uh, I was originally planning to do this lecture jointly with my friend Michael Mahaffey. Uh, but unfortunately, we had technical problems at the last moment, so he cannot join me live, but he did send me some slides, so uh, I will have to, to uh, give his slides without having him uh, uh, live. Uh, Michael is an urbanist, philosopher, and educator, and he was past director of education for the Princess Foundation London. He's now based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Michael and I are, one of Alexand uh, are two of Alexander's generals. There are several of Alexander's generals uh, fighting for a better built environment. I hope someone in the world uh, appreciates that uh, joke. <laughs> Let me begin by using uh, some uh, material from Michael summarizing uh, new urbanism and uh, our approach to the built environment. New urbanism is about the space between buildings that goes back all the way to, to Jan Gale, the uh, very important urbanist from Denmark who has been fighting for the last 30 years. Uh, it is the space between buildings and it is the arrangement of buildings in space so as to complement the space between buildings. Uh, new urbanism is also about the complex connective system of public and private realms, which include buildings. These are topics that uh, all of our team, people interested in human-scale uh, human urbanism, uh, discuss at great length in our books and papers. My own book, Principles of Urban Structure, uh, devotes an enormous amount of, uh, of quantitative and qualitative analysis to these concepts. Here are the challenges in, in Michael's summary that we face. The connective system of public and private realms is surprisingly complex, so there are no simplistic solutions. There is a rapid new urbanization and growth. Uh, we have passed the point, I believe, uh, last year or this year, where 50% of humanity now lives in cities. So urbanism is one of the most important challenges of the human race. At the same time, we have environmental pressures that uh, the human race has brought upon itself, climate change, resource depletion, etc. So uh, the future of human existence and the quality of life of all of, of humanity depends upon uh, urbanism, urbanization, and how we are able to solve those problems. Some of the solutions that, that Michael wants to point out we need a much greater urban efficiency. Clearly what we're doing is totally inefficient. We need a much greater urban connectivity, the ability to move efficiently in many modes. Much of our energy is just simply wasted in, um, in moving around in uh, inefficient uh, fashions. And how are we going to get the solutions? Well, we all believe in, in, the, in, the, in the following solutions. We are going to apply self-organized patterns and pattern generating tools. These are going to be codes that generate sustainable urban, mor urban morphology. So these, these three uh, slides uh, came from Michael Mahaffey. And now let me begin the first section of this talk. I will discuss Duane Plata Zyberg codes. <coughs> uh, these are two people, not three. Uh, we have Andres Duane, 
who is a, an urban planner, and his wife, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, uh, who together formed the, the company DPZ. And in addition, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg is the Dean of Architecture of the University of Miami um, in Florida. The codes that they use and they have introduced into urbanism are a, are a very important practical advance in urbanism. These are form-based codes, but they're totally unlike the ones that are legally binding all urban development. And I will, I will describe the, the uh, uh, important and, and drastic differences between uh, the DPZ codes, which are form-based, and the modernist form-based codes. Uh, unlike the modernist codes, DPZ uh, smart code, uh, they call it the smart code. Uh, though these urban codes uh, enable organic human scale urban fabric to emerge. Uh, however, the codes must be calibrated to local and historical sense of place. And later I'm going to describe how the calibration process uh, occurs, but uh, you can see already that this is not a simplistic, universal application like the modernist codes. Before the codes are applied to a city, they must be calibrated, and that's a, a rather uh, lengthy process, and, and I will describe that, but um, the code must become localized before, before it can be applied, otherwise it does damage. For the moment, let me explain the, the uh, enormous differences between modernist codes versus new urbanist codes. The, the modernist codes are shown on the left. They uh, legalize and create a monoculture, which means single uses. By contrast, the new urbanist codes uh, legalize and create mixed use urban fabric. The modernist codes create a disconnected urbanism. We cannot even apply the term urban fabric. It does not create a woven fabric. It is disconnected pieces. The new urbanist codes are meant to create a connected woven urban fabric. The modernist codes uh, puts emphasis on the larger scale. The new urbanist codes goes to a great deal of trouble in order to, uh, to, to um, encourage all scales make sure they're interlinked and make sure they're balanced so that no single scale will push out the other scales. That's one of the major uh, efforts of the new urbanist codes. The modernist codes uh, either uh, pretend that there are no pedestrians or make sure that there are no pedestrians by the, by the zoning. Uh, the new urbanist codes uh, are fundamentally supportive of pedestrian uh, life. They uh, protect the pedestrian from uh, all the other components of uh, urbanism and uh, place uh, the emphasis on, on pedestrian uh, urbanity. In the modernist uh, codes, the streets divide whatever urban fabric there is. The, the streets act as dividers. By contrast, the new urbanist codes use the streets to unify the urban fabric. This, this is a very important thing. When we see great urban places that work, they all have streets, of course. We need, uh, we need the streets. But the streets are connected. The opposite sides of the, of the streets are designed by codes. They are designed so as to connect. So the, the street itself uh, is a connected entity, and the street acts as a connecting uh, element of the urban fabric. By contrast, the modernist code, the streets cuts uh, any connectivity that, that could po possibly be by, by um, just simply the geometry of the street, the dimension of the street, the way the street is, is organized, uh, it, is a separ it, is, it creates a separation, a chasm in the urban fabric from which a city can never recover. We need to replace all the form-based codes, and by that I mean the present form-based codes, which are exclusively modernist. The code books that are written, I discussed in the last lecture, they written, were written by lawyers following the Second World War. They're all modernist. They automatically produce a modernist car-dependent city. The modernist codes, form-based codes, destroy the pedestrian, human-oriented, and human-scale city that uh, some of us have been lucky enough to live in. And uh, uh, those of us who have been to a, the pedestrian, human-oriented, and human-scale city love the experience because that's what 
being a human being on the earth means living in a nice environment such as that. The only way to reverse urban destruction is to adopt codes for traditional urbanism. Now, on to the smart code, which is uh, what uh, DPZ, Dwayne uh, Pletesheiber, call the, the urban code. This is a generic urban code that guarantees a human scale habitat. It contains many pieces that have to be calibrated for local needs. Therefore, the calibration makes sure that you do not force the same rigid typology everywhere. Now, the nice thing about the smart code is that it is available free online from DPZ or anyone in the world can order a printed copy and, and you just buy the book but if you cannot buy the book it's available free online with sufficient instructions so that everyone can try to calibrate the code to the local conditions so this is something that's given out for free Let me go into the, the, the crux of the matter, which is the calibration. The calibration has to proceed as follows. You have to, to measure the most wonderful examples of urban uh, components from the region that, that you are uh, going to plan in. Uh, find the existing ones, the ones that have not been destroyed. There are going to be many different typologies from different uses and you have to document all of these and you make measurements. You go with a tape measure and you document, you go with a camera and you, and you photograph <coughs> what you think is the most representative and beautiful uh, examples built uh, in the present and in the past from uh, very regions, different densities. There are going to be different typologies in different densities and um, in new urbanism terms, we call the different densities the transect and you wind up with an enormous amount of, of uh, simple measurements. And those measurements are written into the code. That's what it means to calibrate it. Because the code will tell you, for example, uh, sidewalks are going to be between this width and that width. <clears throat> so you have to decide what makes best sense for your locality. The code does not tell you a sidewalk has to be X meters everywhere. That's, that's not the whole point of the code. You have to adapt to the locality and to different uses. So before I go into that, <clears throat> let me tell you where, where Andres Duani comes in. He comes into a city that wants to adopt the smart code. And he comes in with his team, and then he walks around the region of different densities. He identifies different densities. He walks around the region, he drives around the region, and often he flies over the region in order to identify the, uh, the morphology of urbanism of that particular locality. And then he and his team will document uh, what they feel are the best examples. And how do they decide what the best examples are? Well, that's why you pay Andres Duani to come, because he's an expert in human-scale urbanism, and he can find the, uh, uh, the best examples from, from any period of the past, and uh, examples, say, of, of houses, uh, multi-story apartments, uh, uh, commercial buildings, government buildings in different densities because the measurements will change for different densities, uh, streets, uh, frontages, uh, trees, uh, turning radii of streets, all these. These are very mundane uh, measurements uh, that uh, are documented. And then he sits with his team and he writes all these documents uh, into, the, into the code and calibrates the smart code. So the, the, the code then becomes calibrated for that particular lo locality. And I will say that's how uh, Andres Duani and DPZ and uh, New Urbanists make their money. They are giving away their product, the, but they are selling the calibration. So either you calibrate it yourself if you're uh, a city somewhere in the world, or you can invite a, um, a, a New Urbanist uh, uh, team to come in and calibrate it for you, and you pay them, and that's how they make their money. Now, the smart code, I'm not going to, to, to show what the smart code is. It is, it is a very dry, uh, and intentionally so. It just uh, measurements and, and tells you uh, a range of measurements that you build things to. 
Uh, it is written in a legal manner, but there's a, there's a genius behind this. And the genius is that it is written in the same dry legal manner that the present modernist codes are written. And that is meant for the United States to be able to replace its current modernist codes with a smart code. So the transferability is extremely easy. The switch, therefore, is a purely legal matter. All you have to do is you get the local city council to vote to replace the existing urbanist codes with a smart code. And that's it. Then from then on, you guarantee that your locality will grow slowly into a, a wonderful, more, uh, more uh, uh, human-oriented uh, urbanist uh, community. Uh, and the, and the, once the smart code is on the books, then every repair of the urban fabric and any new addition to the urban fabric will follow the smart code. And, and the hope is, uh, and it has been shown in practice, that over time, then the city, which could be the, most, the worst, uh, most ugly uh, uh, sprawl, will start to evolve towards uh, a, a nice, um, uh, more traditional uh, urban community. It, it, all it is is a simple change of, of rules. Now, uh, Andres Duani has, has um, written the smart code so that it can, it's easy to switch in, in, in American United States context. Uh, for another country, uh, the, each country has a different type of urban uh, code system and uh, uh, one has to see uh, how, to, how to better implement the smart code. Now, um, the, all my new urbanist friends, including Andres, uh, are working in projects all over the world, so there's absolutely no difficulty in, uh, in implementing uh, the smart code. Uh, and let, me, let me tell you a story that, that, um, that Andres uh, Duani and Christopher Alexander uh, like to say, and since I'm friends with both of them, I verify that it is, in fact, a true story. Uh, uh, many years ago, Andres Wani uh, uh, went to uh, visit Christopher Alexander, and uh, Christopher told him, well, it seems that uh, your idea about codes is a very nice idea, so what we need to do uh, is to figure out the plugs, because the system is there, the system exists, so we have to figure out the different plugs to plug in. And this is what Andres figured out. You have already the system, which is the bureaucracy that, that runs and creates and, and supervises how to build cities. That exists there. That's going to be impossible to change. Uh, as Andres said, uh, no, no, not even the, the most totalitarian dictator was ever able to change the bureaucracy. They, take, they can take over a country, but they cannot change the bureaucracy. So the bureaucracy you have to live with. But you have a plug. The modernist codes are simply a plug that exists there. It is legally changeable. So what you do is you go in legally, you pull out that plug, and you insert a new urbanist code, and it's a different plug, and the system doesn't care. The system is neutral. But from then on, once you insert the modernist, the, the, the new urbanist plug into the system, then the system itself will produce the, uh, uh, the, the new urbanist environment. Now, uh, of course, it's not as simple as that. Uh, we Alexandrian architects and urbanists uh, are adding more things, more, more of the generative codes that do not exist in, in the smart code because the smart code is only is form-based code and there are layers of very important uh, elements of urbanism that do not exist in the smart code. But this is a, this, we should not make too much of this argument because this argument uh, is like the following. When we compare any of our codes, urban codes, to the modernist codes. It's like comparing one of the uh, current model cars to a horse with an open carriage. When we argue among ourselves about the merits of generative codes and form-based codes, or all new urbanist codes, it's like arguing which is better, uh, a Mercedes or a, or a Cadillac. It, it's a totally different discussion. We are seeking for, for better ways to improve the environment. And any, any one of our solutions is, is a million times better than, than the modernist codes. Now here is uh, Andres Duani's frustration that he keeps um, telling us. Prospective clients ask him to do a project, but they neglect to change their code. So they ask him and they say, you come in, we'll pay you all you want, and you rebuild our city. 
but we, we don't want to change the codes. Well, it is impossible to build a human scale environment with the existing codes in place. That is why I'm going to explain now um, something that, that uh, people uh, notice in uh, new urbanism. In many cases, you need to go outside the city limits where the government can indeed relax the codes because a central government may not be willing to relax the code. So what has that, what has that led to? That has led to um, a point of unjust criticism for new urbanist developments. Because the new, urbanist, uh, ur new, the new urbanists have tried so hard to fix uh, brownfield sites, central city regions. And those local governments refuse to change their codes. So what, what can the new urbanists do? They have to go to places on outside city limits where a developer is, is doing something new and, and they can change the codes over there. So this pragmatic problem that has forced the situation where more new urbanist developments now are on greenfield sites than uh, reconstructing central cities, and now you know the reason why that is so. Uh, some of our modernist opponents who couldn't care less about, about uh, the, the fabric, the urban fabric and, and the lives of people in any cities uh, accuse us of uh, just building greenfield sites. Well, that's, um, it's a nonsensical and, and a nasty accusation and totally unwarranted. Let me go now in general to the new urbanism, which, uh, which includes many different players. In 1993, six urbanist firms got together to write the charter for the new urbanism. And this established what we know as new urbanism or in Europe, it's known as American New Urbanism. Uh, those uh, six firms define rules and practices for recovering the best of traditional urbanism in today's projects. And um, I know most of, the, uh, most of the founders of the New Urbanism movement, uh, personally, uh, and they tell me that they had uh, individually and independently derived the solution that for livable cities, to occur, they have to go and use some traditional urbanism. That was it. And then they discovered that there were at least six of them, and they got together to make uh, to write the charter for the new urbanism. Uh, let me emphasize that this movement did not come from academia. This was a commercially driven uh, movement that now is entering academia after this, this, its enormous um, practical success. Here's a nice sketch by uh, Leon Creer, one of the uh, founding uh, gurus of the new urbanist movement. Leon Creer and Christopher Alexander are the founding gurus of the new urbanist movement. So here is Leon Creer's pie. On the left we have the ingredients and on the right we put the ingredients together to bake the pie. So Leon says that um, modernist zoning, which is a, a monofunctional, is like uh, baking the pie and then you eat the crust by itself or the filling by itself or, or the cherries by itself or the cream by itself. You cannot have, a, have the pie. There is no pie. Uh, on the right is an inclusive urbanism where if you want a piece of the pie, you just cut a piece of the pie and you get a little bit of crust, a little bit of filling, a, little bit, a few cherries, a little bit of cream. It's as simple as that. It cannot get any simpler. Inclusive urbanism is living urban fabric. Exclusive urbanism is dead space. And um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a space that is not only inhuman, but it is unsustainable because it creates a huge energy expenditure. Now, Michael Mahaffey has nicely summarized the promises of, of new urbanism. The return of urbanism is the return of the civic realm, which doesn't exist today in sprawl in sprawling suburbia. The return of urbanism is the return of the street, which has been killed in downtowns and has never been constructed in sprawling suburbia. The human patterns come first. The human patterns in the sense of Alexander's patterns, socio-geometrical patterns. And then the visual ideas follow, the opposite of what is done today. Otherwise, we're simply making people live in disconnected sculptures. And I'm afraid, dear listeners, that that's what we have been doing for decades, making people live in disconnected sculptures, and the world is still not ready to wake up to this reality. There is hope for um, 
for optimism, however, because there is an explosive growth in new urbanist projects and new urbanist ideas. Since the initial Congress of the CNU, the Congress for the New Urbanism, many firms have designed and built new traditional communities. And uh, there is a, a mixed uh, quality to these, but it doesn't matter. Some are more adaptive than others, but that doesn't matter. What, what, is in, what, it, what matters is the explosive growth of new urbanist projects being built on the ground. They are getting better all the time. I was just at the Congress for the New Urbanism a few days ago, uh, the 16th such Congress. Hundreds of people, all these projects being presented. Uh, okay, those who are purists uh, say, well, uh, this particular project is not very nice, it's not very new urbanist. But that's not the point. The fact that a firm that has been doing the worst kind of inhuman sprawl suddenly decides to get into the game and make a new urbanist community. And suppose it doesn't do a very nice community, but it is a, a big jump from what they have been doing. They realize the commercial value of, uh, of a new urbanist project. Uh, it brings in more returns. Uh, it is market driven. So the forces are pushing uh, more and more uh, developers to create new urbanist communities, simply uh, not because they're, they're philosophically uh, um, motivated, but because the profit, uh, they're motivated by profit motive, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the more people are doing new urbanist commu communities, now we have more competition and the quality is getting better and better and better. Uh, we, we are at the point where now we can, we can start to introduce generative codes on top of the, of the form-based codes, which were, which were a revolution, as I said, from, from the modernist codes. But now we, we can start to introduce more and more layers to get more and more uh, human environment, which the situation was uh, inconceivable 10 years ago, or certainly 15 years ago, before the Congress for the New Urbanism was, uh, was founded. It was absolutely inconceivable. Uh, modernist urbanism had a, had a, a Stalinistic uh, a hold of, of all developments. Now, one detail which is important, the, the a new urbanist um, development uh, has to identify different zone densities, uh, which we call T1 to T6, from a, a total countryside a nature reserve down to the, uh, that's T1, an increasing density of, of buildings down to T6, which is the downtown and can have some tall buildings in the downtown. Now, the density of regions, the density of a zone in urbanism changes in the middle of a block, not in the middle of the road. And why is that? That may seem strange, but it, it, it is extremely important. It means that the street, on opposite sides of the street, they have the same urban character, so that the street is an entity, it is an urban entity. Otherwise, if you change the, the zoning density in the middle of the street, as is, uh, is done today, then what is your entity? It is a city block. Well, who cares about the city block? We experience, as humans, we experience the street and we need to conserve the street. So in urbanism, the way we divide the zones identifies the street as the entity. Let me move now to uh, Stephen Mouzon's project. Stephen Mouzon is an architect and urbanist in Miami Beach, Florida, and uh, he's uh, currently working on a project in the Bahamas in Schooner Bay and this is a joint uh, DPZ, uh, Duane, Platis, Iberg, and urban, New Urban Guild project. And uh, he applies the smart code, of course, to the, uh, to the project because it is a DPZ project. But he has developed uh, a little more Alexandrian approach by going one step at a time in the design. And that's, that's not presently in the, in the smart code. Uh, Stephen was kind enough to give me all this material to present in today's lecture, so let me read from, from his notes. Uh, once the paths were set, I began designing just one building at a time, not thinking about anything that would come afterwards. I worked with no intent of artistry at all, just doing the little things that made the most sense for the site in question. 
Only after I had completed the block did I go back to draw the lot lines on another drawing. Those of you who have been following my lectures will see that this is the Alexandrian method. Uh, we discussed uh, uh, the application that, that we did uh, on examples, uh, Nili Portugali in one of the previous uh, lectures. The, the uh, interactivity with, with the design and the site, this is, this is here in, in Stephen Muzon's method. Continuing with his method, the character of the lots could not possibly have been designed without knowing what the buildings were. I don't believe. This is a technique we should have in the toolbox if you're looking for an organic or medieval character for a place. Design first, lot lines later. That's a 100% Alexandrian statement and it is revolutionary if you're approaching it from what our planners do today. Well, let me show you uh, Muzon's uh, drawings, unpublished drawings. First step, the first two buildings and the main internal paths are laid out. He's responsible for this uh, block of buildings in a very much larger project. Tiny turning radii, so fix the internal chamfers. These are internal paths that are going to be used uh, only by uh, pedestrians, uh, bicycles, uh, golf carts, and emergency vehicles. So we certainly don't need turning radii for, for uh, vast speed. Uh, we want to keep the speed down. And you notice how um, uh, Stephen has added uh, four buildings now to the original one, just going one step at a time with some trees on the periphery. Secondary internal paths are beginning to develop to access the backs of the lots. So the path structure now is determined by, um, by the buildings that were added, and the buildings were added determined by what was there. It's, it's a step-by-step uh, algorithmic process, which is uh, what this uh, lecture series is about. Block face to the left, now complete, is in the T5 zone. The T5 zone in the New Urbanist classification is, is a uh, downtown density uh, of, of buildings, but you see here that those buildings are, uh, are going to be um, uh, multi-story or uh, at least they are denser than uh, what's on the right. And what did, what did I just finish uh, saying is that the change from a T5 to a T4 occurs in the, in the um, uh, not in the middle of the lot, but inside the lot, so that the street on the left will be all T5 in the T5 zone. The character and the density of the block changes somewhere inside the block so that the streets are, are maintained. And uh, Stephen has added now some more uh, houses and their position has been guided by what was already there. Next step, after the house on the top street was designed, the location for the path became obvious. So we have the interactivity between the, the buildings as they go up and, and the minor changes. And final decision on the plot lines, which come much, much uh, very late in, in the process, and final decision for the, for the paths themselves. Next, <clears throat> the first work unit is added, an office attached to a house. The new urbanist codes insist on mixed density. Mixed use within certain densities <coughs> and monofunctionality exists only when it makes sense, but certainly not in, a, in an urban, in a true urban setting. A true urban setting has mixed, mixed uses. 
if you if you look at the uh, uh, at the uh, right portion of this, it vaguely resembles uh, suburban houses. But at the, even at this density, we insist on uh, on mixed use. Now, a second and third workspaces are added, a shop and an office. The nearly 30-foot space saved by not having cars in paths has enormous implications. The interior paths of this block are, as I said before, for pedestrians, bicycles, um, uh, golf carts, and emergency vehicles, giving access to all emergency vehicles but not being made to highway standard, as we have in, in, the, in the most remote suburban uh, development today. We have uh, uh, streets made to the, to the tolerance of highways. Now, uh, I need to say something here. <coughs> about emergency vehicles before we proceed. New urbanists have so, much prob so many problems with the uh, fire departments and with the emergency vehicle regulations because uh, in many places in the United States, fire departments require that the street be wide enough for, the, for the one of the giant fire engines to make a U-turn in the middle of the street, which imposes a tremendous width for the street. In our mind, totally unnecessary. In my mind, all you need to do is to have a footpath that can accommodate an emergency vehicle when the emergency arises. The emergency doesn't arise very often, so you need access. You need access to every single point in the urban fabric. But access does not mean speed. You don't have to build these, these uh, roads to the specifications of a highway. Because what does it do? That divides the, the urban fabric. It, it, it just uh, uh, unravels the urban fabric. You don't get any urbanism. But that's a legal matter. And, uh, and my new urbanist colleagues are fighting this legal matter. They're forever uh, uh, fighting these ordinances that, that effectively uh, tie their hands uh, in building. In building um, the right project. So why am I mentioning this? Because this beautiful uh, project now is in the Bahamas. It is not uh, tied by uh, American uh, fire department codes. It does not make it any less safe, however. The alleys are for, for pedestrians, golf carts, and emergency vehicles only. And here you have the completed block, which was done piecemeal, one little piece at a time, and each piece added uh, as determined by what existed at the point. This is, this is the Alexandrian uh, generative process applied here within the context of, of smart codes, uh, the framework or rubric of, of smart codes, because this is still a DPZ uh, project. And you can see that this is a, a development that is more organic uh, than anything that we see uh, in, in American suburbia today. So thanks uh, to uh, Stephen Muzon <coughs> for sending me the unpublished diagrams for, for, from the Schooner Bay project. And thanks also to the DPZ and the Urban, New Urban Guild because this is a commercial project in the process of being constructed, so that there are these are proprietary uh, uh, figures, and they were nice enough to uh, give me permission to use them in this lecture. <coughs> now, in the remaining time, I wish to discuss the tall buildings, because tall buildings come to be a fly in the ointment for new urbanist developments. We are not against tall buildings, but uh, uh, tall buildings seem to be against us. Tall bu uh, skyscrapers are usually designed according to a template. <laughs> and we all know that template, up until just a few years ago, the template was a slab, just a single uh, rectangle of varying width. They ignore the context and the environment. They are an imposition of the architect's will. They can never arise from a step-by-step -step adaptation. How could they? You have a, a, a rectangular slab that you just uh, um, punching into the urban fabric. There is no process of adaptation. <clears throat> what I would like to mention now is the sustainability. Skyscrapers are not sustainable. They're unsustainable. They can never be made sustainable. I am aware that the press 
almost daily shows examples of skyscrapers claiming to be sustainable. But those have um, uh, little green uh, knobs on them, which do not uh, alter the basic, their basically unsustainable character. Using the latest technology does not alter their intrusive character, the intrusive character of the skyscraper into the urban fabric. Any skyscraper introduces an urban singularity because those people have needs, have enormous, uh, put enormous pressure because of the needs on the infrastructure and, um, and a transportation network. And that is usually uh, not the concern of the architect. The architect simply wants to uh, place a symbol of a skyscraper somewhere. Here are Michael Mahaffey's comments on sky, skyscrapers, which I find very relevant. The claim that tall buildings are sustainable is a cruel fraud. There's an excessive heat gain and loss from unshaded exposures and typical glazing systems. So the materials of your, of your typical skyscraper result in an excessive heat gain and loss. There is absolutely no technological fix for that. And uh, I'm aware from reading the the architectural magazines of, uh, of special, uh, highly sophisticated glazing systems. Okay, those are extraordinarily expensive and only minimally efficient. And how are they produced? This is high tech and high tech pollutes the environment. So the production of these systems in order to put them into a skyscraper to save some electricity, the production which is known as embedded energy cost, the production is astronomical. Uh, a skyscraper will have a heat island effect. Uh, the thing gets hot and stays hot. They require materials with very high embedded energy, not only for the glazing that I was talking about, but the skyscraper is made from extremely strong materials in order to stand up. Those materials are not uh, cheap to, um, to produce. And cheap, I don't mean the money it takes to produce them. I mean the energy it takes to produce them. Very high strength steel and enormous tons and tons and tons of very high strength steel. The energy that's required to produce that steel uh, is, uh, is energy that has been, that has been that's contributed to global warming. And you're putting that into the skyscraper, fine. Even the transportation of that steel causes global warming. Where does the steel come from? Is it, is it produced on the site locally? No, it's probably produced in China. And by the time it comes uh, to, to your site, uh, it, you have wasted an enormous amount of energy just in the transportation. So production of these um, very uh, energy intensive materials and transportation of the energy uh, uh, intensive materials uh, waste all this energy. Uh, however, when calculations are done by these optimistic um, uh, spokespeople for skyscrapers, they, they never uh, have this, uh, they never take this into account. They say, well, the skyscraper, once built, here's the skyscraper built as if by magic, will conserve this energy because it has some solar panels and it has some glazing. I'm, a, I'm sorry, but this is a faulty equation. I'm a mathematician. 80% of the equation is missing. You're ignoring it on purpose in order to, to sell a fraud. Michael continues on skyscrapers. The skyscraper floor, pla floor plates are inefficient because of excessive space requirements for lifts and for emergency exit stairs. The taller a skyscraper gets, the more you're wasting its space because you need that space for, um, for, uh, for communication. So the, the idea of, of, uh, of savings, the uh, economy of scale, putting more stories, you save more. That's, not, that's absolutely not true. The, the usable volume in the skyscraper diminishes uh, uh, percentage-wise as, as you go uh, to higher and higher uh, floors. Uh, we all know that they block the sun and the view. So you put a skyscraper next to, a, um, next to anything and it's going to, uh, to block the sun, uh, let alone the view. Okay, the view is an aesthetic uh, thing, but the sun, sun is necessary for uh, building vitamin D in the skin and for preventing uh, depression. Uh, these are physiological effects of, of the people who have to live next to the skyscraper. Uh, skyscrapers are well known to create wind effects at the ground level. Uh, they concentrate uh, the, uh, the, the Venturi effect 
creates uh, vacuums and terrible uh, drafts, and, as well as, uh, as down, down gusts that, that, that throw people off their feet. This has been documented for the last 30 years uh, from, the first, uh, from the first book of um, uh, <coughs> uh, books uh, against uh, skyscrapers. Now, recent studies, uh, this is the most important point of all, recent studies show that the carbon benefits of urban density level off at four to six story building envelope. And uh, Michael is an expert on this, and if you want uh, to hear the details, uh, please ask Michael to, to, uh, to give you a talk. But this is important for, for the following reason. Urban density, the urban density that is achievable with four to six story building envelope, when you, um, when you go from typical American sprawl, which is extremely inefficient and has high uh, carbon, um, uh, uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon loss because of all the transportation and, and the wasteful building uh, of, of American suburbia, or suburbia anywhere. So you uh, condense that in order to, to improve the carbon benefit. That is true. And you condense it until you get to the 19th century European city density, which is, uh, say, four to six story buildings. You would think wrongly that increasing now that density in height increases the, uh, uh, increases the carbon benefit. It does not, because then you start to get into the wasted of embedded energy. That, my, that um, one, was one of Michael's points. So you have reached an optimum. The optimum is like, mathematically, it is the best position. You go off to one side and it gets worse, and you go off on the other side and it gets worse. So if you take the... Uh, the downtowns of the 19th century European cities, uh, Rome, Paris, Milano, uh, any, any uh, uh, of those large cities, and you try to increase the height, you are uh, losing the carbon benefits because you are, uh, you are uh, using the embedded energy of those materials, uh, which I have just mentioned. So there is an optimum, and the optimum is not uh, the optimum is not to reach higher and higher and higher, and this is a uh, this is a misleading statement made by people who should know better, and those who, 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 uh, who do not know any better should uh, uh, lead, uh, read the latest engineering uh, research on this. But uh, it is not easy to, f to find that um, in, in the midst of all the, uh, all the um, um, talk about uh, efficiency of skyscrapers, which is, which is uh, basically false. I have not talked about the most fundamental issue of all, who do we put in skyscrapers? We put people in skyscrapers. Skyscrapers that are built today and for the last several decades, the ground floor is disconnected from the urban fabric. It just, uh, it's, it's a separate, it's an alien entity living uh, in, the, in the city and couldn't care less about the city. Uh, Christopher Alexander gave a pattern 25 years ago an important pattern, that children living more than four stories from the ground feel disconnected. And uh, even though I do not have the data available, this leads to pathologies of children who feel disconnected fr from the ground. All this uh, silly talk about having playgrounds on the 10th story and, and shops on the 10th story uh, were, were utter nonsense. They never worked. They have been tried repeatedly uh, as if uh, people just refuse to learn fr from mistakes. Every time they try, they're a total and abysmal failure. Uh, we are cutting off our children fr from the ground and from life on the ground and from, from a healthy psychological development. The only thing that works on top of a skyscraper is a restaurant where people can go and look at the view, and that has that, it's the only skyscraper typology, a social typology that seems to work. Fine, so, so I support uh, restaurants on the top of a skyscraper. Uh, Leon Creer goes further. Uh, Leon proposes that tall buildings are fine if they're monuments, but not residences or even uh, work uh, places. So it's good to have a tall building to show off a city and to have a, a monument for visual orientation and for the pride of the city, but that building should be a monument with perhaps a revolving restaurant on top to um, uh, to, uh, to please the tourists who come, but certainly not full of residents and not full of offices. 
We have so many examples of bad, tall buildings. They are iconic monsters isolated from the city. They're, they're erected as totems for, for worshipping some lousy architect's ego. The build will be visually recognized. It's the look at me. It's an expression of kitsch sitting in a dead plaza. We don't often talk about the surroundings of the skyscraper because those who build, who, those who design and build skyscrapers don't care about the surroundings. So usually the skyscraper is surrounded by a completely dead space that, 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 um, where no, no urbanism can, um, can take place. Uh, now, I'm not blaming the architects, I'm blaming the clients. Because an architect does not finance a huge skyscraper by him or herself. An architect is paid an architect's fee. They go to the bank, they deposit it. Somebody has commissioned that building and, and the blame, if you don't like skyscrapers, the, dame, the blame lies for those who have commissioned that building. Le Corbusier's original Towers in the Park has become a religious symbol. It is worshipped by modernist urbanists. Why do I say that? Because despite the repeated disasters, it is still used as a modern typology the world over. And this typology, the Towers in the Park, is applied with towers of ever-increasing height. People never learn. But there's something suspicious about people who never learn. Who, love, who never learn, it's a sociological phenomenon. How do you classify a group of persons, a very large group of persons, say uh, architects, uh, architecture critics, and the public at large who, who support uh, skyscrapers, towers in the park, how do you classify them when you see that they refuse to learn from reality, from all those failed experiments? The sociological phenomenon is an absolute faith in something that allows you to ignore evidence, to ignore the physical reality because you have continuing faith in this concept. This is a religious attachment. Only a religious attachment cannot be changed by the evidence. We have religious stories from all the major religions of the world that the uh, the fervent believer maintains onto their faith even in the evidence of temptation, and temptation in this case is, is hard facts of the failed experiments of people's lives ruined by, by being moved into, into, into skyscrapers. Uh, but no, uh, the, the faith is kept and the faith is transmitted in, uh, in our architecture schools by uh, showing them in, in the very first year the uh, towers in the park and I admit, when I see the towers in the park, there is an attractiveness there. There is a seductiveness by this uh, diabolical diagram that Le Corbusier drew. And not surprisingly, I have been accused uh, of being against skyscrapers. But the truth is, I'm not against skyscrapers. There are some good tall buildings. And let me give you my estimation of what are good tall buildings. First of all, there must be very few in any city. There must have always arise in the high density center. And why am I saying that? Because I believe that any useful piece of the urban fabric must arise adaptively and in a piecemeal fashion. So if the, if the uh, center of a city becomes high enough to support a few skyscrapers, that they will arise there. It is more of an organic growth. It is not taking a a 80-story skyscraper and plucking in the middle of nowhere or, or destroying urban fabric in order to put it there. The ground floor of a good tall building must help the urban fabric, must tie uh, intimately with the urban fabric. It must be uh, perforated, bent, and folded all the way around. These are, these are um, uh, major uh, qualities for good urbanism that I covered in, in previous lectures. So where do we find these skyscrapers? Well, we open our eyes and look. We have so many examples from the late 19th century and early 20th century. Today, we don't call them skyscrapers because they're very modest in, in height. What are the characteristics of good tall buildings? They are thin, they have a thin footprint. They're not monstrous in, in, in the width. They're not too tall, 
So as today we don't consider them skyscrapers. But in those days, in the turn of the of the um, 19th century, they were considered skyscrapers, and they have a hierarchy of scales. The design, the design of those early skyscrapers has a beauty, a humanity. It is a celebration of industry while uh, keeping the, the human scale. There's a hierarchy of scales and that makes them attractive. Uh, and more important, the zoning is that there are no setbacks that enables those skyscra skyscrapers to contribute in a very positive way to interconnectivity with the urban fabric. So to conclude, I'm, uh, I'm not against skyscrapers, I'm just against inhuman skyscrapers, and uh, I have just given my criteria for what a human skyscraper can be. Uh, drawing to a conclusion, there are several branches of new urbanism practice today. All of them are far better than zoned car dependent sprawl or skyscrapers in the park, which is a monstrous idea. Communities the world over are building neo-traditional developments. Since Michael can join us, I have some time, so I want to, to describe what I would do uh, if asked to design a project, a large urban project today, and that uh, will hopefully give my listeners an idea of how this process works. So I'm given a project today, for example, uh, the, the Milano Fair that's coming up in 2015. Uh, it has already been allotted to urbanists and architects, but let's ignore that. Suppose it's given to me today. Well, I would bring in an experienced new urbanist firm, for example, Mul Polizoidis, my friend Stephanos Polizoidis, to come in and to draw the master plan for the, uh, for the urban region. And this is a very large, a huge urban region, so we want to do the following. In this particular case, this is a fair that's going to take place. We want to build buildings that are appropriate for the fair, showy, show-off buildings. At the same time, we want to, to avoid the mistakes that all fairs have made. After the fair is over, what do you do with the buildings? We need to plan for livable urban fabric the day after the fair closes. So we are going to build buildings that are, are, are flashy and exciting for the fair that can be immediately used for city the day after the fair. That means that we're going to plan for mixed use, for a, a tight uh, uh, interconnectivity, for density. So we plan for that with a, a, the fair, an occurrence that is a temporary occurrence, but it must be, it's going to be a big success nevertheless. So with that in mind, we work on the master plan and the infrastructure. We, uh, we locate uh, the regions to be, to be developed. We, we um, make sure that they're connected with, with the surroundings, uh, and we develop that. This is a major uh, project like this. Uh, and, and that will be done by, by a new urbanist firm like, like Mullen Polizoides. At the same time, we are going to apply our, our philosophy and start to put together the calibration of codes and the form language, which I've been mentioning in my lecture. The form language will go, we will go back uh, and, and, uh, and find the typical uh, the typical uh, building tradition of that area. Now, since I'm talking about Milano, let, let's continue about the, the Milano uh, 2015 exhibition. We and our uh, people working with us will go all around that region, for, for uh, all around uh, the, the region around Milano, and look at traditional typologies for different types of buildings, uh, houses, um, uh, stores, uh, government buildings, formal buildings, uh, churches, etc. We will document those typologies into a sort of smart code uh, and a, a photographic documentation of the form languages. Then there is a different transect, which I have not mentioned, but it's an important part of the new urbanism. That is the transect between informal buildings to medium formal buildings to very formal buildings, the same type of building. So a house, informal house, is owner built. It can be a little crooked with, uh, with rough materials. Medium sort of building is the medium, me, uh, middle class house that's built, has the same form language, but, but the, the way it's put together differs. So you, need, you have a, a different uh, 
type of, of, of language with, with uh, variations that can be, uh, can be major. And then you have the formal building even of the same type where you want to use it in the center of town. In the center of town, you don't want an informal looking building, you want a very formal looking building. But by formal, I mean our language, our form language. So it, it is more elegant and it is more appropriate for, this, for the center of, of, of the town. So we are going to create a community looking ahead to way beyond 2015. We will create a community with, with the street patterns and the, uh, and the formal uh, regions and the more informal regions. Now, coming up to the fair, we will concentrate on the formal regions because the, the nodes of the formal region will be the, the fair buildings, which are going to be extravagant, uh, which is very good. So. We, uh, we then will call in somebody like, like Steve Muzon, who's, who is an expert in putting together a form language. So he will go around with, with, uh, with his assistants and, and, and uh, local, uh, local architects and, and document the, the form language and the building typologies we will, not, we, we, we will wish to, to apply. This is tectonics. This is engineering. We're not going to come in and build glass, concrete, and, and, and steel monstrosities. We're going to use as much as possible the available local materials in order to save energy and in order to make the thing attach to the ground in a cultural sense. We're going to build something that will attach to the ground. Fine, there will be some buildings that will be extravagant because this is a, an exposition and those extravagant buildings will need some important materials and certainly we're going to, to use those important materials. Then we are going to use a team of, of local architects. Some of us are going to be doing buildings there. For example, I might ask my, my friend in uh, San Antonio, Michael Imber, who is one of the uh, best um, uh, traditional architects in the United States, to go there and, and to study the, the results of, of the form language discovered by, by Stefan Polizoidis and Stephen Muzon. And then Michael will know, in, in order to build a, a commission there, he will know to use a certain a palette of a form language in order to make this uh, attached to the region while being totally innovative. Uh, even the most showcase buildings that we can, we can conceive, we, which will have very extravagant forms, will in their details connect to the human scale. There is a terrible misunderstanding uh, because of, of uh, the recent star uh, architects, deconstructive star architects, that in order to have something uh, extravagant, you need to uh, totally disconnect from the human scale. That's because they don't know how to do better. We know how to do better. Uh, for example, I can ask uh, uh, the, one of the foremost Italian architects, uh, Mario Galvani, who is uh, who's totally uh, ignored by, by the... Um, by the Italian architectural establishment. He's a deconstructivist. I like his work a lot. We can work together, and, and Mario Galvani can, can create a wonderfully extravagant uh, building for, for the expo, and then we, or I, can make sure that the human contact has the right scaling so that somebody can go, can approach this building and say, wow, this is a fantastic. Uh, uh, building, um, uh, interesting, in, in, in like, like Gaudi, but the closer you go to it, you see that it has this human scales. So when you, when you approach it and when you're in it, you feel the intimate scale. The two can go together. It is just that the, the current uh, uh, crop of star architects absolutely have no idea how to do this. We know how to do this. And, okay, uh, to finish up um, my hypothetical planning of Expo uh, 2015, uh, we will get local architects and we'll work with local architects. I'm, I'm sure we can find uh, a team of, of five or six uh, Italian architects who have worked uh, with the local tradition for a long time and have been marginalized uh, by the architectural establishment and the architectural magazines over there. We will try to collect these people and, and coordinate them uh, in order to help us um, uh, create the enormous amount, the enormous number of buildings that we need, and we are going to bring to try to find young architects who are willing to, to collaborate in this. Why do we want young architects? We want young architects so they can see what we do to learn from us, to see how it is possible today to build hyper modern buildings, ultra contemporary buildings 
that attach to the past, that attach to the human senses, that give you a feeling of humanity, that enable you to live to the fullest extent uh, of, of, your, of your biological and, 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 uh, and, um, and spiritual capabilities in the built environment today, using the materials we have today, using the technology we have today. Uh, what you hear otherwise is just a big hoax. Uh, you don't have to, 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 uh, to go against humanity, against human instincts, in order to go to the future. The future is here, the future is in our hands, and the future relies upon uh, connecting with our humanity. I think that's it for today. Thank you very much.